It's good to see everybody here this morning. I'd like you to take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 3. Obvious through this last week, all our eyes were on D.C. Congress and what was going on. I mean, you're kidding yourself if, to say that your eyes weren't there. I mean, we were all interested to see how things would go. Some of it was a little bit of a surprise, some not a surprise to be expected. And I'm sitting there listening to different viewpoints given across and basically come to the idea that I'm not really going to take any of them with too much of a grain of salt of what's said. I step back to something I said a long ago in the beginning of this year and through this year I've said it many a times. What I really want to know is what is God doing and what's his thoughts? Not so much what the right's doing or the left's doing or the world's doing. I kind of know what direction they're going to go already. I come back to the thought of, well, what do I know? I know that the world is going to go into tribulation. I know that the world is going to become a one world government and go the way of globalism. I know it will do that. Now, I pray for the sake of my kids, if the Lord tarries, then does not hit America before the rapture. That is my desire. Okay, and uh, that doesn't mean that I get my desire. But I also know the condition of the church right before the rapture. That's why I want to preach on a little bit the counsel to the church that the Lord gives at this point in time in our history. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and pick up verse 13. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 13. Sometimes when you want to get a correct perspective on things, you have to step back and say, okay, I've been reading my Bible and the Lord's taught me many things. Let me look at what I do know about what the Lord has shown me. That even though the events that I'm seeing right now may not agree with my personal opinions or likes, the facts of the true knowledge of the Word of God are still true today as they were yesterday and the day before and have been forever. This truth does not change. Whether our feelings or circumstances or the things around us changes, the truth of the Word of God does not change. And when you want to get a basis of truth that you can stand on to get your head wrapped up in the right place with the right view, you do not turn the TV on and listen to some person's opinion about what's going on. You go to the Bible and you say, Lord, you give me the first line of truth here. Now, in Revelation chapter 3, in verse 13... He preach, he's giving advice to a church, and it's the church of Laodicea. And this is what he says in verse 13. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thyself, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Let's go to the Lord. Have I prayed yet? No. 
I didn't pray. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray that you'll take and be with this message. I pray that you'll fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you'll speak through me this morning. I know right now is a time of confusion, a difficult time to see what really is true, what's not true. I pray that you'll take and uh, help me with the words that I say to preach your book, preach the things that are true that you show, and that we can take and grab a hold of them things and have something to stand on, something to look forward to, something to strive for. And I pray that you'll take and uh, give us the truth that only you can show, that you'll guide us in truth this morning. I pray that you'll guard my lips, help me to say all that I should say, help me not to say anything that I shouldn't say. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Here, when it comes to the churches in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, there's several applications. And uh, for not everybody of here was here when I taught the book of Revelation. But when it comes to the applications, you have, first of all, you have a doctrinal application. Say, what is the doctrinal application? The doctrinal application of the three, seven churches is applied to groups that are in the tribulation, going through the tribulation time period. These are churches, a church is a called out assembly, so they're groups of assemblies inside that has certain characteristics that the Lord gives one. The doctrinal application is not going to apply to you. That's somebody that's in the tribulation. We may be close to it, but we're not in it right now. Okay? Then you have spiritual application. Spiritual application is what the... What you can take in the passage is teaching in general that you can apply. That con you can also call that practical application. All scriptures has a spiritual and a practical application. Now they, they are a little bit different. Um, practical is just the practicality of the statement. Spiritual application is when the Holy Spirit, maybe a verse jumps out of you and you apply it to yourself. And you spiritually apply it to yourself. And it really has nothing to do with doctrine. It's just the Holy Spirit saying something to you out of the Word of God. Practical application is your learning of everything in the Word of God and applying those principles to your life. Everything from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 has a practical application for us to learn from and to apply to our lives, regardless of what the doctrinal application is. Okay? You understand that? It was written for our learning. We can learn from Adam and Eve in the garden, even though we are not in a garden and we are not given the commandment to eat of a tree of knowledge of good and evil and not, or to eat of the tree of life, but not of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We can't really put that on doctrinal application. Yeah, we can put the doctrinal application that we've all fallen into sin because we come from Adam, but you see, you're not, you are not in a temple sacrificing the blood of bulls and goats. You can't put yourself under the law anymore. That was passed at Calvary. No longer does the Mosaic law apply to you. But the things in the Mosaic Law is still the mind of God. The fact that thou shalt not commit adultery still applies today. Matter of fact, every one of them Ten Commandments apply today as a practical application of what pleases God. Okay? So you don't want to disregard anything in Scripture. There is a practical application for you to learn from. I want to take the practical, and then you have the third one, which is the historical. The historical was during the time of John's exile, there was seven churches in Asia Minor that was being addressed. Those were historically real churches. That's historical application. And that's just the Bible as, you know what the Bible is? It's a history book. It's historical application. The best history you have is the Bible. Yeah, sure. That's an absolute history. You know, you say, why is that? Because they're rewriting history. Yeah, yeah. Trying to rewrite the Bible. But they're rewriting history. 
Okay, so you have the histor doctrinal, spiritual, and historical. I want to take the spiritual application. The spiritual application of the seven churches is each church stands for the condition of the body of Christ or the church in its time period. Okay? Right now, you are in the time period that matches the Laodicean church. And that's the last one before the tribulation events of the tribulation starts. That is a spiritual application. So for the church's condition, the Christians of today, the warning that's given to Laodicean is going to match our condition. It says they're rich. Would well, you know with the, the movement of the uh, technic, technical age, economical age, uh, there is less starvation. The world's population has blossomed because they've been able to deal with sickness. They've had a more luxurious life, which may have been good, may have been bad, because I don't think our bodies are conditioned to handle hardship the way they were in the old times, because we've had somewhat of a life of ease to a degree. Uh, you don't have to ride horses anymore. You ride a luxury car with heated steering wheels, heated seats, that plays music, relaxes you. You can sit the recliner back. It's cushioned. Have you ever rode a horse? Do you realize that's what they used to do all the time? <laughs> I mean, you either rode a horse or you walked. <laughs> okay. And uh, so, I mean, and, re and when it really comes to it, the people of the last hundred years have not lived in a reality world. They've lived in a technology world. And uh, so you could say we're very rich. Even the poorest in America is usually very rich compared to what they were in days of past. Okay, when you look at the past. Uh, hunger has been a natural thing in the world for thousands of years. Right, because not everybody has had food. for th Starvation was a normal thing. I mean, you look at COVID and the way we're reacting to COVID. But if you go back 100 years and you look at some of the plagues that came through and they could do nothing about with it but take it and bury their loved ones. And some of that, I mean, there was a kill and children kill. I mean, you still, Africa still has a little bit of a reality. Uh, when you ask them how many children they say, they'll say three living, four dead. And that's their normal way of answering. That is normal in that continent. That's the normal way. That, we don't even think that way anymore. So the Laodicean church up fits us today. Also it says, I would that you were hot or cold. Well, that describes Christians today. We're lukewarm. We're not strongly convicted about anything. It's more of, well, whatever fits your desire. Go to the church of your choice. Do this, do that. You know, I mean, it's one of these mushy things where it's a kind of a do as you wish. Please oneself. They're lukewarm. He says, I would that you were cold or hot. If you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of the mouth. So it matches us today. Well, if it matches us today... Shouldn't we stop and look at, see what the Lord's counsel is? And that's really what I want to preach about. This has all just been introduction here. But if you look at verse 18, it says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eye with eye salves, that thou mayest see. What I'd like to preach on this morning is the counsel that God gives us today. The counsel. Now there's some counsel here. And His counsel is good. First of all, He says, Buy of me gold tried in the fire. Buy of me gold tried in the fire. You say, what is that? Well, if He's talking to the Laodicean church, which is rich 
and they say they have need of nothing. Well, they can't be talking about materialistic goods here. Amen? It says, buy of me gold tried in the fire. Well, it isn't materialistic gold, because they're rich. That's not what he's talking about. What is this gold tried in the fire? Well, first of all, let's look at what the fire is. The fire in this is trials, tribulation, and persecution. That is what the fire is. Take your Bible and turn to Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3, pick up verse 8. Is that, is, no, I'm sorry, Zechariah 13. Zechariah 13. And pick up verse 8. Zechariah 13, 8. And shall come to pass that it all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. So how many die? Two thirds. Two thirds of them die. It's a lot of death. And I will bring the third part through what? The fire. Death is easy compared to the fire. Death is merciful. Especially for a Christian. Because they go to hell. At death, that's where their problems end. It's not going through the fire. But the ones that are left goes through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. So the gold is gold that's tried in the fire. It's purified in the fire. It goes through that fire and it's made into something. It's refined. It goes through the refinery process. And the Christians need to go through a fire today. They need to be willing to go through the fire because that's where they're going to buy the gold. They need to be gold tried in the fire. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Christians that's living a life that's going to please God is going to have to learn to go through a fire. It's something that we have to accept that going through that fire is God's molding process. It's His process to make us into something, a vessel that's valuable. Now look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now, that's kind of a twisted way of looking at things. He said, be, be glad that you're going through a fiery trial. You say, why is that? Because there are some events that happen in the fire that allows you to buy some gold that's going to make you rich for eternity. This gold is gold that is, shows up at the judgment seat of Christ. We read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It says every work will be tried of what sort it is. And it says some is gold. Some is gold. Comes forth as gold tried in the fire. So that fire is the trials and affliction. The second thing we know, we know what the gold is. The gold is the works that amount to something for eternity. The gold is the works that amount to to something for eternity. In Job chapter 23, verse 10, after he goes through his fiery trial, he says, But he knoweth the way that I take when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held his steps, his way have I kept and not declined. 
Job's sitting there. He's gone through it. He loses all his children. He loses all his possessions. He winds up sitting in ashes, covered with boils, in extreme pain. His wife walks up to him, says, gives him some good, loving, wise counsel, says, curse God and die, and walks away. And his three friends says, hey, this is all your fault, because you must have been self-righteous. I mean, you, you must have been wicked to do this. God wouldn't have done this to you if you was a righteous man. First prosperity gospels the world ever knew. <laughs> God wouldn't do this to you if you were righteous. Okay? So he gets all this hit and he says, what's Job's answer? Though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Now Job's upset, naturally. You read the statements of Job, he's upset. Have you ever been there? You know why. He's upset. And uh, he, he says some things that's anguish of spirit, obviously. But his attitude is, though he slay me, get my serve. He's not going to turn against God. He's going to go through the fire for God. He says, I know that when I am tried, I will come forth as gold. The trying is the time and opportunity to find the gold. It's in the fire. It's in the trial. It's in the time of affliction. That is your time as a Christian to find the gold. In the church prior, he tells him, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. So it's not a physical richness that makes a Christian rich. It's spiritual richness. And that is earned in the fire. It's earned in the fire. It's earned in tribulation. It's earned in trials. And then he says this in, to the Laodicean Christian. He says, uh, you must buy of me. Now look at how it's worded. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. It says, I counsel to thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. In other words, this gold has to be purchased from the Lord in the fire. That's where you're getting it. You're, getting it. you're buying it of Him. He says, buy. Now what does buying indicate? Buying means it's not free. Now, he's not stealing from you. You're buying it. In other words, you have to voluntarily purchase it. If you're buying something, you, you're going to buy this. No, that's called theft. <laughs> okay? That's not you making a purchase. A purchase is you voluntarily going to him to take something. It's of your own free accord. Now there's several things that have to be in place for this for you to be able to buy gold tried in fire. First of all, the fire has to be there. The fire has to be there. Guess what? In this nation, the Laodicean church is going to have an opportunity to walk into the fire. Your opportunity is there. The fire is coming. It's there. It's being stoked up seven times. The fire is being built. But you can choose to not go into the fire to buy. You can say, you know what? The cost of that gold is too much. I'm not going to walk into that fire. I'm rich and I have need of nothing on this world. Materialistically, you're rich. You have need of nothing. You don't have to walk into that fire. You don't have to go into that trial of affliction if you don't want to. You don't have to. I'll give you a perfect example of this. Take your Bible and turn to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Here's three men that was tried in the fire. Literally tried in the fire. And uh, look in Daniel chapter 3. Pick up verse 14. Daniel 3, 14. 
how Nebuchadnezzar had set up an image and he had told all the people in Babylon and when you hear the sound of all kinds of music you're supposed to fall down and worship this image. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, you know what, for me to do that and be sinning against my God, I'm not going to do it. Amen. So they stand up. They stand up in the time when they were rulers. They were in a pretty good position in Babylon due from chapter 2. They got themselves put in a place of position, a place of riches, a place of honor. And if they had just behaved themselves, they had it made in the shade. All they had to do was listen to Nebuchadnezzar. That's all they had to do. But they're more interested in the gold of the fire than they were in Nebuchadnezzar. Look at their statement. Look how they respond to this situation. Verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye shall fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall, be, shall deliver you out of my hands? They had a choice. All they had to do was bow. They did not have to go into the fiery furnace. They had that choice. Amen? It was their choice. Look at their choice. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. I love that. Oh, that we had some manhood today. Oh, that we had that. If ye be, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. There's their faith. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. There's their determination. They have the faith. They know God can deliver them. But if he doesn't, that's fine. They'll burn up. They still won't turn against God. Why? Because they have that long look. They got that long look. Heaven is the prize, not this earth. If they die in this earth, so be it. And they're willing to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And they enter into the fire. And guess what they find? They find the gold that they can buy from who? The Lord. Because the Lord was in the fire. He was in the fire. It wasn't until they went into the fire that they got close to the Lord. And walked with the Lord. And the world seen the Lord was with them. That's where the gold is, my brethren. It's in the fire. It's in the fire. And you don't have to go into the fire to get the gold. But if you want it, the counsel is, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Well, what am I trying to say to you? I'm trying to say, for the Laodicean church, the fire has been built. You're going to have an opportunity to serve God. But to do it, you have to walk into the fire. You have to walk into the fire. And it's going to be much easier to say, I'll walk around the fire, or I'll just stay out here with the world. The world warms themselves around the fire. And to do that, you have to deny Christ, as Peter did. You deny it. Because that's where the world is. They're outside the fire, looking in. For you to get close to the Lord, you've got to go in the fire. you got to go in the fire. And it's a volunteer. Uh, let me ask you something. Right now, it's looking like... Now, I'm not going to make predictions. But, 
You know, there's a possibility you could lose your freedom of speech. You can lose it. We've been spoiled as Americans. We haven't tasted the fruit of communism like a Chinese Christian has. But you might get your opportunity. There is a likelihood. You can say, I'll go around it. I'll take and join a revolution. And we'll just kill them all. And then we'll start over. That's trying to go around the fire. As an American, yeah, that's tempting. But <laughs> no, that's not. You know what the Bible says about the violent man? The heart full of murder, strike. What I'm telling you to do, I'm telling you, go into the fire. Get your eyes on Jesus Christ, just walk in that fire. Say, Lord, I'll just walk with you through this. I'll walk with you through this fire. It's a voluntary thing. And it doesn't matter what the world does to you or doesn't do to you. I'll buy me gold, try it in the fire. Why? Because eternity is what matters. You're just a pilgrim in this foreign land for a short time. Eternity is what matters. Next thing I see in the counseling was not only do we have to buy gold of him tried in the fire, but he also tells us here in Revelation 3.18, he says, uh, I counsel thee, buy me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. He also wants you to buy white raiment. You say, now what is the white raiment? The white raiment is the righteousness of the saints. This is righteousness. Revelation 7 19, chapter 19, verse 7 and 8, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice. And give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife had made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Amen. What does that mean? One simple thing, do right. Righteousness is doing right. When it comes to all aspects of what your emotions cause you to do or make you want to do, you need to step back and say, is it right? Is it right? Or is it wrong? If you'll just step back and ask that one question, most of the time it can change the outcome of your action. Because when you're emotional, and hyped up, and angry. The wrath of God, as we saw in Sunday school, the wrath of God worketh not the righteousness of God. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. The Bible says, be ye angry, and sin not. Yeah, you can get angry, but the trick is not sinning when you're angry. That's where it becomes difficult, because your emotions take over. And when your emotions take over, as we looked in Sunday school, the inside of the man comes out. The Bible says the Lord knows what's inside man. And you're deceiving yourself if nothing but good and love is inside, you think good and love is inside of you. The wrath of man comes out. So you have to sit there and say, is it right? You know what I'd wish a lot of people had done in D.C., I wish they would have asked themselves, is it right? Is it right to do what I'm fixing to do? They could care less about what's right. They just want what they want. And you can put that on both sides. You can put that on both sides. They just want what they want. And I ask him, is it right? You take in a charge you by raiment that thou mayest be clothed. 
In Ecclesiastes 9, 7, and 8, it says, Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with merry heart. For God does now accept thy works. Let thy garments be always white, and let them, thy head lack no oil. You know what the white raiment is? It's righteous works. It's righteous works. So I thought you was a Baptist and you thought salvation was a free gift. Yes, but righteous works are not. Those are earned. I believe in righteous works and I believe a Christian should do righteous works. And I think you should work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You say, what does that mean? That means the salvation of your body as you live on this life, you should work to do what's right. You should work to do what's right. Not for your eternity and your soul, that settled. God did that for you. Amen. But your life has not been settled. And you need to work that out in righteousness. Judgment seat of Christ, you're going to be judged according to what you do. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. A Christian should keep in mind that there is a judgment coming for him. Say, I've already been judged. I was judged at Calvary. As far as your soul going to heaven is concerned, yes. But as far as your life is concerned, no. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And he's talking to Christians there. Not the lost. The lost stands before the great white throne judgment. That's two judgments. If you look up at this chart... Your judgment seat of Christ is there before the tribulation. You're raptured out, you go to the judgment seat of Christ. At the end of the millennium is the great white throne judgment. When the dead, small and great stand before God. Two different judgments. Alright, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse 2. For in this we grow earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not, what? Be found naked. Why do you not want to be found naked? You don't want to be ashamed. Only a twisted person is not ashamed when he's caught naked. That is not a normal person. A normal person's not going to walk around the streets naked. You say, what does that mean? That means three quarters of people in summertime are not normal. <laughs> okay? <laughs> They're barely clothed. <laughs> okay? Not naked. Shall be found naked. For we... Th- now, look at... Uh, look at verse 9 and 10. Wherefore we... Now, if you go through here... You want to learn a great lesson in chapter 5 of who the context is. Circle we every time you see it. Starting with verse 1. You got two we's in verse 1, one in verse 2, one in verse 3, two in verse 4, uh, two us's in verse 5, uh, three we's in verse 6, one we in verse 7, two we's in verse 9. You get the ideal? Paul is including himself in this assertion to the Christians. He's not talking to lost. He's talking to saved. Okay? Verse 9. Wherefore we labor that whether, pres- uh, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Now what's that acceptance? Is? That's acceptance of our works and our righteousness as we live. Not our salvation. This has to do with your works. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. In other words, everything you do in life will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. And that ought to put the fear of God in your life. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Say, but I thought you believed in eternal security. I do. I'm not talking about your eternal security. I'm talking about your shame at the judgment seat of Christ. The shame of your nakedness 
up here. Your works, your righteousness. There is rewards at the judgment seat of Christ for those that serve them. They'll receive crowns and rewards. Amen? Amen? Those are earned rewards. They're not just given. Right. Right. They're not just given. They're earned. And those who do nothing for Christ in their life will have no rewards. At, at their shame will appear. They did nothing. You know what they get to do in the millennium? Sit on the sidelines and watch. They've been benched. <laughs> They're benched. They're not going to reign with Christ. They get to watch. Why? Because there's no works. I believe in once saved, always saved. I also believe that we should work so we are not ashamed at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. So there, he's counseling us to clothe ourselves in righteousness. Thirdly, the third thing that I see the counseling to the Laodicean church is this. Go back to Revelation chapter 3. Look at verse 18. It says, White raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Now here's the third thing. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. In other words, there's something wrong with your vision. It's been all crusted up. Have you ever woke up and your eyes are real crusty and your eyelids are crusted to the bottom and you have to wet that thing and anoint it and if you try to look, you're looking through this crust, you can't see, your eyes all blurred. I, I mean, am I getting the description across to you? Okay, have you ever had that problem? Then you have to wipe them, clean them, anoint your eyes so you can see. You know what you have today? You got a lot of Christians can't see past the front door. They can't see a spiritual thing that's going on around. Their spiritual eyes are blind as a bat. And uh, one of the greatest cleansers of the eye when it has a problem is a tear. It's a tear. The tear washes the eye out. It wa if you ever get something in your eye, tears is what helps wash that thing out. Sometimes you need an outside source, but your eyes will start watering. The reason it's watering is it's trying to get something out. It's trying to get that thing out. In Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4, it says, And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. Set a mark on the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry, for all the abominations that is done in the midst thereof. You know what I salve is? That is a broken heart that will recognize the problem and the sin. Like I told you in Sunday school, the biggest problem the White House has right now is they're trying to blame everybody else for their fault. Every single one of them should walk up to a mirror, stick their finger up in that mirror and says, there's the problem. Right? I mean every single one of them. Every single one of them. Every single one that's outside the courthouse through D.C. all go home, look in the mirror, and put their finger up in that mirror and say, there's the problem. Every single one. Until you deal with the problem of oneself, you can't deal with the problem of someone else. You cannot deal with the problem of someone else. They're trying to fix everybody else's problem, but they won't fix their own. They won't fix their own. And uh, it takes a broken heart. It's never right to start a revolution unless you start it on your knees with a lot of tears. And I'm, I guarantee you, a lot of those folks haven't been on their knees bawling and crying their eyes out for the sins of this country that wants to go out there and change this country. You know how I know that? Because these houses are not full. 
They want to say it's a righteous movement. Then why aren't they coming in through the doors? Why ain't they filling the seats? Why ain't they trying to get something from God? I hear it just all the time. I mean, they're pushing. And God we trust. They're bringing God into it. God into their movement. God into their cause. But the pews are empty. You're using God as an excuse to do what you want and justify your actions. I know I'm talking to a conservative group here. I'm not trying to offend you. I'm trying to get you to look at more of a biblical view. We're going to the Lord for counseling here, not Fox or CNN. Okay? When you go to the Lord, He strips it open for you. He says, all right, first of all, we start at the mirror. We start at the mirror. And then we go into the fire. And you've got to get close to me. That's the perspective the Christian needs to step back and say, hey, I need to get back to them root fundamental things of walking with the Lord, having my eyes on Him, buying gold tried in the fire, putting some white raiment on, and anointing my eyes with eyes on. We've got to get back to those roots. Those root things of the Christian life. How close are you to the Lord? How much are you willing to serve Him? How much are you willing to endure? You know what the Lord said about the political situation of His day and age? He says, the violent take it by force. Violent take it by force. That's hard. As Americans, that's hard for us to accept. I mean, as an American, the words give me liberty or give me death always rings through my mind. I have that in me, okay? I grow up with the stories of patriotism. Yeah, you know. And buddy, when you grow up with that right now, your blood just boils. It boils. I thank God we can balance ourselves out with the Word of God. Say, you know what? I have a higher calling than the United States of America. I have a better country. And I have a better leader than Donald Trump. Amen. I think he was good for America. I don't buy all the stuff they say about him. I don't buy it. One of the last things I didn't give you through all that stuff or all the things I uh, said, you remember the sayings I was giving you in Sunday school with uh, all the people, the political people that was pushing the riots throughout last year and uh, the words that they said and then how they switched right at this last one. Oh, sorry, they switched it. Uh, I had a quote for Donald Trump at the end of that. You know what he said? We love you, go home, go in peace. With love in your heart, go home, go in peace. That was his statement. Yet he's the one that's banned for causing strife. I, I understand there is a responsibility with him. There is a responsibility. But come on, let's be real. Who's at fault? Everyone. Every last one of them. Let's not just sit there and say, oh, he's the one that's at fault. Let's blame him. When you're blaming someone else, you're not dealing with the problem. Not dealing with it. Anoint thine eyes with thyself. There's a whole chapter, John chapter 9, we can't go through it. But this is the healing of the blind man. This is the healing of the blind man. And the clay and the spit was put on the blind man's eyes. And he goes and the Pharisees, they're not concerned that this man could see anymore. They want to know who healed him on the Sabbath. And they're all upset. They get distorted. They have their convictions about the Sabbath, but they miss the whole point. They miss the whole point. And they're sitting there, they're 
grilling this guy to get mad at him, and he finally tells him, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. Well, you know what this blind man happened to this blind man? And all of a sudden, he could see. He could see clearly. And then the Pharisees ask him to one time, they sit there and ask him, hey, uh, he gets upset with them, and he says, well, if I told you, if I tell, told you, will you be his follower also? And they get mad, and they throw him out of the synagogue. You know what the problem was? The blind man's eyes was anointed with eye salve. The Pharisees, who had their conviction, who had their cause, who had their reasons, who was lifted up and looked at as the religious leaders, eyes were not anointed by Jesus Christ. Their eyes weren't opened. They were blind. You cannot open the world's eyes until the eye salve and the spittle of Jesus' breath touches their eyes. They're not going to see you. The devil's blind at the minds of them that believe not. Lest the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. You know how you take and get that to happen? On your knees. Bawling and crying for the sins of this nation. Oh, every head bowed and every eye closed. I hope that this message allows us to refocus and get our eyes back on the Lord Jesus Christ. My heart's broke for this nation. I love this nation. I pray for this nation. I know the nation has some hard times it's going to go through. And it breaks my heart. I, I don't like seeing what's going on. I don't know that I want to be any part of it. I do know something I want to be a part of. And it's in the fire. That's where I'm headed. I'm going to walk into the fire and get close to the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you go with me? Will you go with me? Will you go in that fire and get close to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Hey, I want some gold for eternity, uplifting your name, preaching your gospel, standing up for the things that you believe, not worrying about what's going on around me. And then when the world sees it, they can sit there and say, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, He is the one true God. When they see that, that's what's going to open their eyes. Will you go into the fire? Buy you gold tried in the fire? All right. Let's have a song of invitation.